I got fans <sighs> running, so you can pick up a noise profile. Boom. I'm also breathing heavily, so I probably, probably could use a nose, pro- nose profile. For my, a nose, a nose profile. My nose profile? <laughs> uh, call Larry Bird up. That's a, that's a nose profile. Oh All my right, God. Uh, Larry Legend did have a giant schnoz. Uh, record breakers in a three, two, one. Buenos nachos, amigos, and welcome to another fine episode of Record Breakers. I'm PD Rave, and I can't breathe right now. With me, as always, is my quorum of yahoos. Uh, we've got none other than Drew. Hey, how's it going? We got Brett. Hey, diddle diddle. We've got Patrick. Hello, party people. We're going to once again to talk about music. Uh, the provider of the music this week is none other than Brett. Brett, what do you got for us this week? We have the uh, 2001 album by the band Guar, Violence Has Arrived. Mm-hmm. Uh, a very fascinating album by a very fascinating band. Uh Drew, what expectations did you have coming into this album? Well, Gore was a band I had heard about, but I never really heard much of. Um, I grew up in the 90s, so you sort of always heard about Gore being one of those bands, the ones that all the the mothers and the politicians didn't want you to listen to. The, oh, this is what's ruining American music and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was very standoffish, but from the metal fans that I knew. Um, the thing was always that if you listen to it, you would understand the joke. Like, and obviously they didn't, but I never dove into it really. So what I was expecting was metal with a lot of gore, maybe a bit of dark humor, um, some sex and things that would off put many a mother in Midwestern America. <laughs> Very many, a, put their uh, buns in a twist, if you will. Uh, Indeed. Patrick, what expectations did you have coming into this album? Um, most of the guar I've heard is sadly going to be their uh, their AV undercover performances. Which, if you if you've got fifteen minutes of your life, immediately pause this show, go watch all three of their AV undercover performances. They do Kansas Carry On My Wayward Son. They do uh, Get Out of My Dreams and Into My Car by Billy Ocean, and most recently they did uh, West End Girls by Pet Shop Boys. And that, that's pretty brilliant. Um, but beyond that, I knew, I knew they're a metal band. I've heard little bits of them, but I've never been, I've known a lot. I've had a lot of friends who were super into Guar, but I was never super into Guar. So this was kind of my first time really sitting down to an album of them and listening to them with some sort of level of paying attention. Mm -hmm. Brett, what would you say makes this, uh, record twit, record tick? What, what makes up this album, uh, music wise? Well, I mean, it's, it's coming off of a, of a pretty bad performance that the band really didn't like. And the album, we kill everything. I think that was 99, 98 era. Um, they really did not like that album. A couple members left between that album and this one. Um, it, the, it was, it was so unlike that uh, rumor had it that if you went to the message boards and brought up the album or any of the songs on it, you would get banned from the message boards. Um, but uh, this one is sort of a, a back to form um, where, you know, you put Odorous in the in the front seat, um, you know, as the primary vocalist, you, you bring back the thrash metal sound that they had and uh, you, you bring the theatrics to like, you know, crank it up to 10. Um, it's it's got a very, very, very like it. If you're not prepared to get the most uh, like brutal and, and dark lyrics, uh, you don't even don't even listen to this album because you're going to be offended. But if you're willing to put in some time for the jokes, uh, you'll you, you'll have to drudge through some some pretty swampy territory. But 
yeah, it's a it's a very very uh, high paced, um, very strange for the turn of the millennium when it came out. Um, but uh, you know, I enjoy it a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drew, what would be the themes and elements that stood out for you? What caught your attention about this album? Um, he actually put it very very well. It's a thrash metal record with some humor to it. Um, in certain parts, there's there are songs on it and we will surely get to them later that have, um, very, very, um, very heavy sexual innuendo, um, and very heavy, like just brutality to them in the lyrics. The music was simple, but brutal is another word that I would just use here because it fits. It's fast tempo. It's like just sort of sludgy. It's, it's very much what you think of, like if you see a picture of Guar, and you think you can sort of expect the type of metal that they're going to play, you're going to get it. And the thing is that because of what Guar does, and it's very theatrical, that sort of plays very well into the character, this like weird sci-fi bent that they have to them, which I think is really, really cool as far as like that whole story driven bit goes. Um, and that's sort of what this record was, was just, it was a metal record about brutality and blood and sex. And that's sort of what freaked people out in the nineties and made them sort of gain their notoriety in the early nineties. And they showed it here as he said, um, they say it was coming off of a bad record. I would like to hear what the bad record was. Um, to try to figure that out and why they hated it so much. But um, this one, they made the record that they were aiming to make, and I think they set out and they achieved the goal. It was a thrash metal record to the core. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pat, what would be the themes and elements that caught your attention? This album took me back to my metalhead years, Uh, basically like, eight years ago when I was in college. Um, it's it's thrash metal with with um, a couple of hev- heavy uh, shots of like er- like early 90s Florida death metal thrown in just for good measure. Um, it's It's got some things going on. Uh, the bass is really prominent, which I love albums where you can actually hear what the bass guitar is doing the whole time. And I thought that really, uh, really worked out. Uh, Odorous's vocals are kind of fun they're they're very much like a florida death metal sort of low guttural sort of screamy thing but without getting into like the pig squeal vocals and uh his singing was like a an untrained world dane from a from nevermore who's a power metal band who doesn't exist anymore and between all that like it was it was it was i was asking myself where was this band when i was really into metal because i think i would have i would have latched on to this because i like that it's it's fun. It is over the top. It knows exactly what it's trying to be. It's, I think, as much an art project as it is a metal band, and I kind of like that about it. Yeah, I wonder if Florida death metal is the preferred music of Florida man. <laughs> Florida man. Florida death metal band. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Brett, what would be some of the key tracks for you? What, what what are the tracks to kind of zero in on with this record? Well, I I enjoy the song "Abyss of Woe," um, which is uh, which goes back to a theory that uh, me and my buddy Mark have that uh, that uh, the I I don't want to say that Odorous isn't a real person, but the guy behind Odorous, uh, or that used to be would go out of his way to write songs just so he could say like he there was a song called ham on the bone just pretty much so that he'd go ham on a ham on a ham on a in a song and uh abyss of woe is probably one just so they could have a chorus of woes um <laughs> but it's a it's a pretty groovy song uh immortal corruptor uh starts out with like this uh crazy spanish flourishing guitar lick uh that goes on for a while and then it goes into the metal i i enjoy that song a whole lot um uh, another song that uh that should be mentioned is the song lixor which is all about a cat and uh, it's it's uh its owner is an old crippled lady who dies and then the cat eats her um which is uh is 
just as awful as it sounds, but the, if there's a song about cats eating their owners, that's the one. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Song of Words. Uh, I, I, you know, it, it wasn't long ago that I said talk singing only works in one night in Bangkok. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I think I forgot that this, this song existed. Um, it, it, has, it features both uh, Regis, Philbin, and O.J. Simpson. So, uh, <laughs> if, like, go, go out of your way and listen to that song if you want to know what happens. <laughs> Not good things. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and spoil things that. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to ask. Okay, Drew, what would be some of the key tracks for you? Um, I'm semi gonna do the record breakers thing. Um, although this is not the very first track, Battle Lust, I think is sort of the first beginning full song. It's a song that's fast. It gets your attention. It goes perfectly at the beginning of either a record to get your attention and snap you into it, or at the beginning of like a set which I think Guar is something I kind of need to see just because it's it seems like a spectacle, and this, to me, goes to prove it. You start with something like this, you get everybody's attention, you whip everybody into a frenzy, and it really worked on that one. It was quick, violent, bloody, sort of what I thought I was getting into when I heard uh, we were going to listen to Guar. Uh, the next one was Anti-Antichrist, and that one, the... To me, if Battle Lust is the beginning of the set list, this is in the middle to get everybody back into shape because you always have that lull at a metal show where, like, the beginning you have people sort of getting tired and the pit's not going as hard as it was at the beginning or whatever. This is the song that the lyrics and the music sort of build that crescendo. You sort of get that fist pump and you're ready to go back in. And the song that... um. I wanted to bring up very much so was the song where the joke of what Guar was hit first for me and made me chuckle. And that was Bloody Mary. Um, that song on very, very, uh, very many and differing levels made me laugh. Um, the, the hairy bits and all made me uh, chuckle quite a bit in that one. So yeah, hairy bits, uh, to you <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Pat, what would be some of the key tracks for you? I, I will second uh, Brett's calling out of Abyss of Woe. That was just fun, catchy, but still metal as fuck. Um, and it just it had a had a really good sort of thrashy metal thing going on. I really really liked Apes of Wrath. I don't know why it just was it was so like like speed metal old fashioned thrash it was really fun um but the one that kind of like caught me was I'm, I'm listening to this and this was like you know an hour and a half ago when i was finally making notes for this and i hit the last song on the album happy death day and i just went what because <laughs> it's 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 thrash metal ted nugent that's what it is like it is it's got that country sort of twanginess to it but it's still metal as shit and i would listen to a whole album of it it's great it's the there was there's a couple of it reminded me there's a, a Mastodon song that has this weird little chicken picking kind of, you know, one off 10 seconds of the song. That's the coolest thing on the record. This was a whole song of like, of like, like country metal, you know, Ted Nugent kind of thing. And it was kind of a surprise. And I liked it because it was like, oh, I was not expecting this, but I'm happy I got it. Yeah, there's some fantastic tracks on there. <laughs> That you guys pointed out, yeah. Uh, and I have to go back around the horn to kind of get some conclusions. Drew, what would be your conclusion about the album overall? My conclusion is if you want ridiculous thrash metal and you don't want serious ridiculous thrash metal, this is the band that I think is perfect for that. Um, As I said, this album just made me want to see them live because I think that knowing the setup and knowing the music now, I think in a live setting that would be fantastic. But on an album, you can tell that they're all smart dudes that made this music because it was composed very well and it was it sort of pointed exactly to the purpose of the music. And that to me just proves that you have smart musicians that know exactly what they're doing. Um, And 
that to me was what this record was, was it was a fun way into the theatrics of a metal classic, which I think is cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patrick, what would be your conclusions about the album overall? So this is more of a conclusion about Guar, but the album within that. So the best thing about Guar is that Guar ever existed and that it continues to exist. Uh, metal takes itself way too seriously too much and Guar doesn't. It takes it takes the the performance, the art seriously, but with this coating of of thrash metal because why the fuck not? And because because it scares Midwest suburban moms. I mean, they're from Richmond, Virginia. If you've ever been in Virginia, it's it's the kind of place where this music will scare people and that that really gives you a sense of what they were going for. They're they're cartoon characters, in, in the best way possible. You know, they're larger than life. They're ridiculous, but at the same time, like they're they're good musicians. This is this is a well executed metal record just from a musical perspective. You know, a lot of times, like if you if you go back, and I think out of out of the bands like I'm really familiar with the one that I could most closely associate Guar with is like Green Jello. Green Jello with the exception of having Danny Carey play drums on their, you know, big hit serial killer record, were never good musicians and they would be the first to admit to it. And whereas Guar, I feel like all of these guys can play. It might not be perfect, but it's good, solid, well executed thrash metal. And I think as an album, this is pretty fun. I mean, there's there's not one song on here I'm like, wow, this is awful. No, they're kind of they're all kind of good. Some are really good, and some are thrash metal Ted Nugent. PD, I'm not hearing anything. Uh, Brett. What would be your conclusion <laughs> about the album overall? Um, listen to this album, and uh, if you've never seen Guar, wait until you're done hearing this album, and then go look up an image of what they look like, uh, and be like, just just like like what Patrick was saying, you they did not have to be this good to be in the genre that they're in, but they are better than they have to be in executing music. Um, you know, so they they this is well into the career of Guar, you know, they're the, you know, this is probably about the, uh, the going downhill when you started to, uh, and through the next decade, start losing, uh, losing members, uh, through, uh, pretty un, unfun means like overdose. Um, but, uh, you know, this, it's, it's a magical thing and it happened at a certain time when, uh, you know, this stuff was really like, they're never going to get radio play. They they barely even got like the the only play I ever saw was on Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. They they did uh, Sadama Gogo, but yeah. uh, you know they were, they're, they were they're, the central uh, caveat of the Genesis video game. <laughs> yes, you had to find pieces of the the, the tickets uh, and return them to Sleazy P Martini uh, right. to get get into the Gore Show. But like like they they're never they. they they are a band that is based completely off of people's rumors about them, hearsay, <laughs> and people being like, "Hey, check this out." And you know what? Hey, check this out. You know, yeah. let me be that be that push if you've never heard it. The, hey, hey, check this out. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, yeah, they they are pretty much that band, <laughs> exactly as you said. Uh, that's it for our thoughts. I'm mostly on on Guar. Uh, some interesting thoughts. And now we're going to get to our main events of the evening. We'll get to our haiku reviews. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm going to start us off. I'll give mine. And I'll say, it'll make you say, God, what an awful racket. But in a good way. Uh, next up, we're going to have Drew. Drew, what is your haiku? Brutal. Bloody war. Fair use of sexual tone. And fun for the theater. Mm-hmm. Patrick, what is your haiku? So fucking metal, I can't believe this exists, but happy it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brett, what is your haiku? Irreverent rock, theatrical, disgusting. They're one of a kind. Uh-huh. Uh, yes. 
Uh, and that's it. You know, that, that, that's pretty much sums it up, uh, for high, you know, war, uh, violence has arrived. It really has, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and that's our thoughts on the album. You can, of course, find this on our Spotify playlist. Uh, I'm going to try to link it. It's in the show notes for the show on the episode page on our website, umbrella.net. So you can go in there. I usually try to link it every time I post the episode. So follow the link there or ask us, ask us where you would like to hear uh, us to curate a playlist and we'll do just that. On that uh, playlist is going to be our next album, which is provided by none other than Drew. Drew, what do you got for us next week? Well, a little bit of ska, a little bit of pop, a little bit of disco. It's a band from Huntington Beach, California, a band that actually got their start inside of Disney World, Disneyland. Which one's in California? Disney World. Disneyland. Band- Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland. Okay, I was wrong. Whatever. <laughs> um, got their got their start as sort of a house band inside there, and that's how they made their money. And it shows in this album. It's a Suburban Legends with their 2012 album day job Ooh, huh. and we look forward to discuss the discussion of that album uh but that's it for us you can of course find us all over the internet patrick is at swagger brett is at hibbity bibbert h-i-b-b-i-t-y-b-i-b-b-a-r-d drew is in a row at, drew is at x for x i'm at pd rave uh, the show's at four record breakers. That's the number four record breakers. Recordbreakerspodcast.com. We're on, you know, rebelli.net for this and my, all and the other shows. YouTube dot, uh, YouTube.com slash rebelli TV. Uh, check us out, subscribe there. See all the vidges. Uh, we might, I might do vidges of other things other than the live recordings of my podcast. I don't know yet. Uh, but if you want to see them, subscribe to the YouTube. Uh, but that's it. Until next time. Hasta los huevos. I don't care what you think about the politics. Anne Romney is a fucking devil looking woman. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh my God. She scares me every time I see her. Her smile is, like, frightening to me as a human being. Anne Romney. Oh. Uh, she's, there, there's something very Stepford-y about some of her pictures. It's, just, it's <laughs> just this... <laughs> you went to Utah, PD. <laughs> yeah. There's some of that going on. Uh, I'm sure there is a town in Utah called Stepford. Dude, I'm Googling that. Oh, I sneeze all over my desk. Against Utah County Stepford Wives, the Facebook page. Stepford, Utah. <laughs> oh. Sifting the desert, baking between the Rocky Mountains, occupies a cone filled space known as Stepford, Utah. <sighs> I, I'm not LDS. I live in Utah County. What's up with this? Ask a Mormon. Ask a Mormon Girl is the blog of author Joanna Brooks. Unorthodox answers from an imperfect source. Drew asks, I'm a 20-something who lives in Utah County and not an LDS, or I've ever been. I have recently embarked on a quest to try and better understand what the LDS church as a whole, as well as what it means to be an LDS member. Is there something about the culture of LDS regions in Utah County that is different from the experience of practicing members living outside of Utah? Answer is like a wall of text. So I'll, I'll just leave <laughs> askamormongirl.wordpress.com's question from 815 of 2010 for a later date. Yes. <laughs> Wait, was that the last question? That's the one that came up when I was when I yeah, asked when Steph for Google. Utah. Ask a Mormon girl dot WordPress dot com. Oh, there's one in June. <laughs> uh, are we already for the most uh, congested episode of Spreck and Breakers yet? 
I'm right there with you. I, I had bloody noses all week, so I'm like, I feel fantastic. The real Mormon moment is now. Never felt as good as how I feel right now. So for me, wait, hold on. Day, no, when I felt stop. the way that I do right now. <laughs> right now. Right now. I like the, the subtitle. The real Mormon moment is now. Subtitle. The real Mormon moment is now. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis. No. <laughs> the real Mormon moment. Now. It's, it's now. The it's, Mormon moment. We're never going to be allowed on the Frog now. Pants Network now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we're being bigots. It's you're, now. You're, we're, not, though, we're not saying Mormon people are horrible. Although I did we're, say we're that just... on MSFW once. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think I said that on the SFW. You're allowed to say all sorts of things on that show. Well, not anymore. Um, but. No, you're no, you're not, because I called in on their like call out communist episode, whatever, and they were debating over whether Steve Jobs was a communist, and I called in, and the first thing I said on the Twit Network was, "Uh, Steve Jobs is a total commie. What are you fucking talking about?" That's buddy? what that's what I just said, <laughs> bro. Right, hold on. Hold on. Whoa, you think this show's not You're... safe for work? And they, pro <laughs> they promptly hung up my Skype call. <laughs> Probably should have gone with screw you guys. <laughs> I, d I didn't realize that you weren't supposed to curse on Twitch. That wasn't like a purveying thing in my mind. Because I had only seen the edited episodes. That was the first night I had watched live. <laughs> I decided that, that was the night that I was going to call and say, fuck you. 